How's it going everyone? This is High Yield MedCat and today we're going to take a look at how we can approach genetics problems on the MCAT with sort of the general algorithm or step-by-step -step process that we can fall back on with any genetics problem. Specifically, ones that take a look at probability, like this problem that I've derived from an actual double AMC MCAT practice problem. So feel free to take a look at this problem and come back when you're done. So pause the video, take a look, and then come back. All right, so hopefully you've had some time to look at this problem yourself. Now in our algorithm, our first step is going to be determining whether this trait is an autosomal trait or a sex-linked trait. Now in humans, autosomes are the chromosomes that are chromosomes 1 through 22 whereas sex-linked chromosomes are simply chromosome 23, which can either be X or Y. Now, the main thing that will differentiate whether something is autosomal or sex-linked is if the trait shows a difference in expression between males and females. For example, if this problem were to say male flies were generally more yellow and female flies were generally more white, we might have reason to believe it was sex-linked. However, because there's no difference between the sexes of flies in this problem, we're going to assume that it is an autosomal trait, or located on an autosomal chromosome. In other words, any chromosome that is not a sex chromosome. The next thing we need to determine in step one is if this is a single or multi-locus genetic problem. Now, a locus in genetics refers to the place located on a chromosome where a gene is located. Generally, when we do single locus problems, we're looking at a singular gene. If we're looking at multi-locus problems, we're looking at multiple genes. In this case, we're looking at one single gene, and that gene is coding for a body color. So we have one single locus. So what we're dealing with is an autosomal genetic trait encoded by a gene on a single locus. Now step two is we need to start with our parental genotype, then determine our F1 genotype, and then finally our F2 genotype. Now in order to do this, we are given some basic information kind of out of order in this question. So it says that two yellow flies mate and produce 29 yellow flies and 11 brown flies. Now that might appear a little bit confusing. Like what exactly do we do with that? Well, we realize that this is rather close to 30 yellow flies to 10 white flies. And that 3 to 1 ratio is something that you may have seen before, whether in your intro bio class or genetics class, if you are a biology or biochemistry major. So let's draw out a Punnett square for the F1 generation. Now, we don't know our parental genotypes yet, but we could probably figure them out because we know that three of these squares have to code for the dominant trait, the yellow body color. And one of these has to code for the recessive trait, which is white body color. So, since most uh, loci are named after the recessive trait, we'll do a capital W to denote a yellow allele, and then a little w to denote a white body allele, and we know there's at least one big W allele in these three boxes, and at least two little Ws in this box. And we can probably intuit that our Punnett square is going to look like this, where we have one big W, big W, one big W, little W, and another big W, little W, and then finally two little Ws. So that's how we get our 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. And the only way for this to happen is if we cross two heterozygotes. So big W, little w, big double, W, little w. Oops. Big W, little w. So in our parental generation, we have determined our parental genotype. There was a fly that was heterozygous, so big W, little w and we crossed it to another heterozygous fly. So now we've determined the genotypes of our F1 generation. 
Now, the actual question is asking us, if two yellow flies are crossed, what is the probability that both yellow and white flies will appear in the F2 generation? Now, one important thing we want to take note of is that they're specifically asking if we choose two yellow flies. So we want to ignore this probability of one-fourth of getting this white fly from the F1 progeny. So we're only looking at all of the progeny that are going to have yellow bodies. So we're going to actually be calculating probability out of three instead of out of four, which is typical in Punnett square problems. So if we have two yellow flies, we have a couple different phenotypes that we could cross together. We could cross a big W, big W with a big W, little w. So those would be both yellow flies. Or we could cross a big W, big W, and a big W, big W. Or we could cross a heterozygote, big W, little w, and another heterozygote, big W, little w. Now, our first combination is only going to lead to all yellow. So that's not what we're looking for, because there's no white that shows up in this. Our second combination is also going to yield all yellow, because there isn't even one recessive allele in any of the F2 genotypes that would be produced. However, our final one, where we have two yellow F1 flies that are crossed, but we get the same ratios that we did in our first problem, 3 fourths yellow and 1 fourth white, we do get both phenotypes. We do get yellow F2 flies and we get white F2 flies. So we need to find the probability of getting crossing these two flies together. Now because we ignored the little w, little w here in the F1 generation, we're going to take this out of three. So out of these three genotypes, we have two heterozygotes and one dominant homozygote. So the probability of a yellow fly selected at random being a heterozygote is two-thirds. And selecting a second fly that's also a heterozygote is going to be two-thirds as well. And if we multiply these together, assuming that we're selecting these yellow flies independently, we will get two times two is four, and in the denominator, three times three is nine. So we will get four ninths, making the answer A to this problem. Now a couple things I want to mention before we wrap up this video is that notice they said assume Mendelian or Mendelian inheritance patterns. Basically, that means that we have a dominant and a recessive allele and that one gene is coding for the phenotype. Now in reality, most traits in, for example, in the human body, do not actually follow Mendelian inheritance patterns. They're actually a bit more complex than just simply dominant and recessive. Further, most traits in the body, for example, height, have a bunch of different genes that include, um, that ultimately result in a phenotype. For example, I believe it's at least more than 50 genes we've discovered in the human genome have some influence on someone's height after they grow up. And of course, genetics isn't the only story. If we are a mal uh, malnourished individual, we won't reach our maximum genetic height, no matter how good our genes are for being tall. So just some things to think about uh, in the bigger picture of genetics. That's it for High Yield MCAT. Feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment letting me know what topic you would like to see next. Also feel free to check out my free amino acid playlist that can be found in the link below.